description below. Now, on with the next episode. Chapter 12 Now I was beginning to get the hang of the air car's controls. I found I was quite enjoying the sensation of piloting it, feeling the agile little craft responding to every nudge of the control column. It was a pleasant novelty, and one I might have savored to the full in less crowded skies. As it was, I proceeded cautiously, peering through the murk surrounding me, weary of colliding with something big enough to swamp me from the air. Fortunately, the course suggested by the machine spirit took me in a wide, gradually rising spiral around the main spire, which meant that there was little in the way of accuracy infrastructure to collide with, and the onboard indent beacon was transmitting a code reserved for the governor and his household so everything but the largest of the least maneuverable cargo hull was lost no time in getting out of my way. Of course, speculating about the identity and the motive of my would-be assassin took up a good deal of my attention, too. My first instinct was to contact Amber Lee and see if she could throw any light on the matter. But I couldn't be sure that my Vox transmission wouldn't be monitored by some eavesdropping device concealed aboard the flyer. If... Whoever was behind the attempt on my life was unaware of my avocation as an occasional and really reluctant agent of the Inquisition. Letting them know about Amber Lee and her mission was unlikely to end well. Besides, I had no doubt that she'd hear of it sooner rather than later, and take whatever steps were necessary to protect herself. The would-be assassin had definitely been human, and the Eldar weren't known for using collaborators. The most likely concludes with the Chaos Cult we uncovered on Drachia. Why they'd bother trying to assassinate me, only the Emperor knew. But then, Chaos Worshippers were bonkers by definition. So it's usually a waste of time even trying to find a rational motive for anything they do. Inquisitor Vecman might have some ideas, although I wasn't all sure I wanted to talk to him. Emily clearly thought he should be kept at arm's length, and that was good enough for me. Probably the best thing I could do would be to consult her at the earliest opportunity, and leave it to her to tell the other Inquisitor as much as she deemed appropriate, if she thought it would do any good. Thus, musing and concentrating on manipulating the control column, which I found had to do quite frequently to avoid drifting away from the course, I was attempting to follow. It was some time before I realized that the murk surrounding me was a little less dense than it had been. The running lights on the other flyers and shuttles in the air were shining out more strongly, and the dim outlines of hulls connecting them had become more visible. The spire itself began to appear, too, a vast shadow in the shifting yellow fog, gradually taking on a form of solidity which would dwarf mountains. A short while later, I found myself rising above the smog layer entirely. The air clearing was suddenness which took me completely by surprise, and laying the entire spire open to view, rising from the layer of foul, discolored air like an ancient tree from the foited waters of a swamp. At this altitude, it was scarcely a dozen kilometers across, rising to an elegant summit no more than a couple of clom from one side to the other. Looking upwards, I could see innumerable cargo vessels, still too far away to make out as anything other than tiny dots circulating and completing a bresque like a cloud of midges over a stagnant water. As they arrived at and departed from the upper docks, 
Between there and wherever I was, the sky seethed with other airborne traffic swarming up and down the length of the spire and driving into the charcoal clouds below to reach the bulk of the hive itself. Many were arriving and departing at landing platforms and docking ports clinging to the outside structure, the relatively short trip around the exterior being a good deal faster than trusting to the hive's internal transport system. Though I was no more than about halfway through my leisurely climb, the sky was beginning to darken in color, taking on a fresh bruise, tint that presaged the thresholds of space. Well, intellectually I knew it was nowhere near tall enough. I found myself wondering if it actually passed beyond the limits of the atmosphere. It was particularly no reassurance myself of the ridiculous notion that I glanced outward towards the far distant geomon of another spire rising out of the cloud bank, and thus and inevitably saved my own life. Two air cars almost identical to my own except for being painted black instead of the blue and gold were closing fast from above, from outside the normal traffic lanes. The other big difference between our respective vehicles was the heavy bolter slung under each of them, certainly mounted, and shooting in my direction. If you read any of my musings or heard them in audio form, you wouldn't be surprised to find that my first instinct was to evade. I brought the nose up and fed power to the fans, both of which elicited squeals of protest from the little vehicle's machine spirit. I had no time to remonstrate with it. However, opening the throttle to its limits and clawing for height, they're hardly proficient at aerial combat. I'd spent enough time in enemy airspace to know just how vital being higher than your opponent could be. Mayday! 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 I transmitted, just to be on the safe side. This is Kama's Arcane, under attack by enemy aircraft. If the lightnings Castine told me about were still anywhere in the vicinity... They certainly make short work of the reluctantly light and slow-moving air cars. If the Elder Scout were already keeping their hands full, of course. Responding, Castine's voice said in my ear. We're trying to get the defense force to put something in the air to support you. The lightnings are still five minutes out at least. Acknowledged, I said, trying to sound calm and probably not succeeding very well. Any sign of the Elder? Not yet. Justine said. But if they get below the smog layer, the fighter pilots wouldn't get so much as a glimpse of them. Since there was nothing I could do about that, I immediately dismissed the matter. If I allowed myself to get distracted by potential threats now, I'd be dead from the actual one long before the flyboys turned up to avenge me. The two sinister black air cars turned to follow my change of course, Tracer rounds from their weapons floating lazily past my windscreen in the tenuous air. If any of the bolts hit, and there'd be at least five times as many rounds I couldn't see, the flimsy civilian vehicle would be shredded. At this altitude, I couldn't hope to stay conscious for more than a few seconds if the hole was breached. Kamazar! Fresh voice cut in. It sounded vaguely familiar. But it couldn't quite place it until it spoke again. This is Governor Fletcher. I've dispatched some of my personal guard to relieve you. I'll be there in minutes. Thank you, I said as politely as I could manage under the circumstances. Like the lightnings, it sounded as though there'd be minutes that I didn't have. Seeing the tracer closing in on my position, I cut the powers from all four fans, dropping like a stone and watched the two streams interact, exactly where I would have been a few seconds later. But though I managed to save my skin in the short term, in so doing, I squandered the advantages of altitude. The pursuing air cars turned and began to swoop towards me, the voluntary mounted weapons spitting again. I fumbled the array of levers and shot upwards and backwards, could do more quickly than I intended before getting the vehicle back under control. Once again, the intended attack struck home against where I was no longer was, and I couldn't keep trusting to luck 
and if I'm honest, my lack of proficiency at the controls taking the pilots, who knew what they were doing by surprise, for much longer. Governor, I said, does this thing have any weapons? Of course it doesn't, he said, sounding faintly bewildered. It's an air car. So are the ones shooting at me, I said, a little more briskly than I intended. And that doesn't seem to be stopping them. One day I'm going to learn to stop feeding the Emperor straight lines. No sooner had the words left my mouth, one of the explosive projectiles hit home, detonating against the bodywork and missing the front right fan mounting. A handful of centimeters, and the grace of the Emperor. I felt the whole vehicle lurch and fought to regain control, banking into the tightest drive I could manage in hope of shaking them off. No such luck, of course. They both turned and dived after me, civilian traffic scattering in panic as we powdered down the side of the spire, close enough to make out faces staring from the viewports, and the occasional void-suited spire jack, who broke off whatever they were doing to stare after us in astonishment. To my relief, the passenger compartment didn't seem to have been breached by the detonation. As grateful as I was for that fact, it confused me rather. Only later did I realize that a vehicle intended to be ridden by the governor was bound to be armored rather more thickly than the apparent at first sight. Can you shake them off? Castian asked, and I found myself shaking my head from force of habit as I responded. Not a chance, I said. The weight of the drag of the bolters, which I was pretty sure hadn't been installed by the original manufacturer, probably impeding my pursuers as much as the mass of the armor was degrading the performance of my own flyer. But they were used to piloting these things. I wasn't. And, as I already discovered, blind luck can only last so long against superior skill. As if to emphasize the point... The air car lurched again as another bolt hit and detonated, this time a red warning icon, the precise meaning of which escaped me. But the gist of it was pretty clear. Lit up on the dashboard, I poked at the controls and tried to turn, finding the little flyer notably less responsive than it had been. One of the rear fans had been damaged, making me a sitting target. I jinked frantically, but the two enemy air cars were nailed to my six, not taking their time to line up a killing shot, which, unironically, was their undoing. Had they simply opened up immediately, relying on the hail of bolts to inflict a hit, they'd almost certainly have done enough damage to send me plummeting to from the skies to my death. But for whatever reason, they were spending a few precious seconds to make sure of it, Though I was probably as surprised as they were when the leading car had disintegrated mid-air, ripped apart by a hail of Eldar shurikens. I found the missing Eldar, I vox Castine, although it would probably have been more accurate to have said that they found me. A trio of heavy jet bikes, the pilots tucked away in the closed cockpits with the gunner spat heavy ordnance from the exposed pillion seat which seemed like a distinctly uncomfortable arrangement to me, were soaring up out of the concealing smog below, blazing away with everything they had. Three vipers, in close formation, not looking friendly. Like the elder we face in Drachia, they were livid in green and purple trim, a combination which put me in the mind of the carnivorous plant of Maestrash. Not a particularly comforting association, the surviving air car jinked frantically, banking and diving for the refuge of the colloquial clouds below. But it was a futile endeavor, the Eldar craft turning to follow it with billet precision. A crack war had detonated against the Marauder's canopy, blowing the roof off and sending its luckless pilot spinning out into the void. A moment later, what was left of the bodywork was shattered by a hail of fire from the Shuriken cannon. Then all three Eldar Raiders banked smoothly around and began to climb in a rising spiral, chasing one another's tails. With a distinct stinking feeling, I realized that my reluctantly ponderous air car was at the center of the circle where they were describing. I began to climb, 
putting off the inedible for as long as possible, already aware that I could only buy myself a handful of seconds. But even that was better than nothing. To my surprise, they were holding their fire. But I was under no illusion that such a happy state of affairs would be continuing. To be honest, I was a little baffled as to why they hadn't finished me off already. They're closing in, told Castine. May the Emperor protect you all. It might strike you as a surprisingly pious statement for what I honestly imagine would be my last words, apart from a probable oh frack the way down, but it was the sort of thing someone like a reputation of mine was supposed to say. It would play well with posterity. Besides, a small part of me was still assessing the options, refusing to give up hope before I actually hit the ground, which, given the number of times I've already escaped death by millimeters, was hardly surprising. I've cheated death rather on those occasions by sheer bloody-minded refusal to accept the inevitable. It's saw no reason to do so at this time now. By some miracle I did manage to survive this. I certainly would hurt by standing among the troopers if my periods of last thoughts had been any of them. And a prayer for their welfare rather than my own. To mention the fact that if I was about to meet the Emperor in person it probably wouldn't hurt to have made a good impression prior to my arrival. <clears throat> I glanced to the left, finding one of the vapors pacing me, the gunner swinging the heavy weapon in my direction, while another slotted neatly in the place above me, and the third behind and below, no chance of repeating the trick which had discommoded the air cars. Then, if I was cut the power to the fans, this time I'd simply drop sight through the lower Eldar's line of fire. If I put the nose up and try to climb, the one above would get me. If I tried to write, one next to me would still have a clear shot. It's completely boxed in. Unless I swung left instead. I rammed the vapor pacing me, which would be pretty much suicidal, of course. But pretty much isn't the same as definitely, and staying where I was certainly didn't look like an option. In situations like this, I found it's better simply to act before your self-preservation instincts kick in, rather than think about what you're about to do long enough to have to argue with your subconscious. So I took a firmer grip on the control column before glancing across at the vapor, preferably to yanking it hard over, and found myself looking straight into the pilot's eyes. For a timeless second, our gaze is locked, and I completed the movement I'd begun. Serving the air car right at the Eldar Flyer a handful of meters away, and bracing myself for the impact, which never came. The Viper swung smoothly out of my path, maintaining the sapertine between us almost to the millimeter, and all three of them tilted their noses skyward and soared upwards, vanishing from view within moments. Lost among the myriad of motes dancing in the sky around the spire, Top leader, we have visual, and are on pursuit. A fresh voice crackled in my vox, and the air shook around me with a thunder of afterburners. The lightnings rippled through the sky, the distinctive swept forward wings, making them stand out vividly amongst the weather-rigid crit of the spire's outer cladding. Then they were passed and away creating more of a flurry in the local traffic patterns than the Elder ever managed. A second later, the shock wave of their passing hit, leaving my damaged air car bobbling like a cork in a waste fill. Straightening up and steadying, the flight path took up most of my attention for the moment or two. By the time I had any to spare of my surroundings again, I had already acquired new and far more welcome company. A couple of armed grav speeders in the same Gibber National livery as what was left of the car I was piloting, were pacing me. A vox speed crackled again. Governor Fletcher's compliments, Commissar. We've been sent to escort you in. <laughs> Much obliged, I said, waving to them with all the insolence I could muster. I think I've had enough sightseeing for one day. Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> so as you can clearly see, I'm still a little sick from uh, the Wuhan Wheeze. Because I got it again. It's like my fourth time getting it. Yeah, this time around, it only took me uh, a week to get over it. Not that big of a deal. It was awful. Like, genuinely awful to get through. I do not wish this upon anyone. This has been a awful experience. For the first three days, I was sleeping just dead in bed. Ugh. It was bad. Then it just slowly turned into, like, a sinus infection. And, yeah, it was just awful. Ugh. Anyways, let us say thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. Cesar E. Lopez, Jamie Davidson, Ricky Brown, Matas, Josh Sickles, Azuth89, Thompson235, Starboard, Alak NPC, Ken S, Mike H, <laughs> Hunt, Fortis Unan, Eldrick Madrid, uh the gay pussy eater. I'll say it. I'll say it once. And Cocoa. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to be Patreon support members of the channel, you can in the description down below. There is a free thing you can go on there and you can see all the free stuff that's up on there, which is gonna be uh the Team Fortress 2 tabletop game I made. The uh, Warhammer game I made as well, just the rules for now, since I'm working on the codexes for all the armies. It's taking freaking forever since I keep changing everything, slowly but surely, after every other game or so, for balancing inquiries and, well, maintaining that everything stays on a level playing field. I don't want one army to be stupidly overpowered, while another one that's older ends up being kind of just like left in the wayside. I'm not GW in this case. <laughs> if one army gets an update, all the armies get an update. So if there's a new rule that's added for scouting, all the armies get something added to any scout unit or something like that. If something is added for the medic, everyone gets a thing for the medic. If something is added for the morale, everyone gets something for morale. It's basically that. So... If your favorite army doesn't have a codex yet, it's either one, I haven't gotten around to making a digital form of it yet, or two, I have the physical form still being tested out for differences in how, the, how it should work on the table. Like, um, First Bar Marines and Primary Space Marines are two different codexes because they are not the same army. They do not fight the same. They do not act the same, and they are not raised the same. I'm going to be working on a video later this week, basically trying to tell uh, the differences between a Firstborn and a Primaris Space Marine Legion. What's the differences between them, the fighting styles, how they act, uh, how they feel about humans, and everything is going to be coming from the most recent... Um, lore from the different books I've been reading to a character series for transitioning from Firstborn to Primaris and the differences between what they feel then versus now and how it affects them and their battlefield prowess and how their mantras change from transitioning. <laughs> Anyways, that's enough out of me. Hope you enjoyed this book. Uh, chapter. Glad to see that Kyphus Kane is safe out of harm's way. We're halfway done with Choose Your Enemy, so... Oh boy. Things are only gonna get higher and higher from here. Up next, either Cothonia's Reckoning or something from Heralds of the Siege. <clears throat> or even the um, next section of the Imperial Infantryman's Handbook. Whichever comes first, 
You will see it later. Anyways, I've been me, you've been you. Thank you for watching another one of these videos. Hope you have a great day out there. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Whatever time you're listening to this. Hope you have a good day, night, or afternoon. <laughs> Alright, see you in the next one. Bye.